All right, welcome back. Um, let's get started. Uh, so today, I'm going to finish talking a little bit about more Collider stuff. In particular, uh, I'll talk about Jets a little bit. Jets is a huge subject, but I'll get uh, into it a little bit, and then we'll just start talking about the different kinds of particles you see in the standard model and how they show up and how to think about them from a Collider physicist's point of view. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to so update the LHC. This is today's. This is the website showing the, what's going on at the LHC. And it's not much. It's in a technical stop, and they're kind of playing with the beams, and uh, there was no collisions in the last day or two. Um, but I did want to go back to uh, this uh, version of it. This is the one I showed on Monday, where it was actually running. We actually had a great run going from uh, 8 o'clock to 8 in the morning, so about a uh, 12-hour run. Uh, and we talked about why this is, this is dying down, and I told you it was become because of the the actual collisions depleting the beam, and someone said, well, that can't possibly work. But nobody caught me, but it actually does work. So I just want to take a minute to go through the numbers there. Um, so does anyone remember the numbers that we talked about before? So the relevant numbers are how many uh, protons are in a bunch? Do you remember that? 10 to the 11. So 10 to the 11 protons per bunch. Uh, what about the bunch spacing? 25 nanoseconds. So how many bunches are there? How long, how big is the LHC? 27 kilometers. Okay, so how many, so 25 nanosecond bunch spacing, basically everything's moving at the speed of light. How far is that in distance? 25 feet, okay. How, how big is 25 feet in kilometers? <laughs> how about meters? Eight, okay. Eight meters. So, uh, 27 kilometers, how many bunches are there? 3,000. 3,000 bunches. Fine. And what did we say the collision rate was? Gigahertz. So we have one gigahertz. So, it's a, so we have one billion collisions per second, right? And we have 3,000 bunches of 10 to the 11. So we have 10 to the 14 protons, right? And we're losing a billion of them a second, right? So that's 10 to the 9, right? Um, so in an hour, how many do we lose? Right, so an hour is 3,600 seconds. So that basically cancels this 3,000. So we're back to uh, uh, well, 10 to the 11. Uh, so we're back to losing a billion out of the 10 to the 11 every hour, right? So, billion, so 10 to the 9 out of 10 to the 11 is 1%. Right, so we're losing 1% of, of the protons every hour. Um, and so what does this do? Well, it starts here and goes down from, well, uh, this is a, yeah, I don't know, it goes from two, two and a half to one and a half times something. I mean, oh, you can see it over here. Oh. I don't know, not, so. These, these numbers, I mean, it decays, so this would be, this is three hours, so you expect it to decay about 3%, which is roughly what it's doing. So in 12 hours, it decays, you know, 12%. Of course, it's exponential. Um, and this is the linear beginning, but eventually it'll start to be exponential. You can't really see that, so that's about what they run. So that, that you know, it's order of magnitude correct for what we're seeing. So the dominant effect of depleting the beam really is from the collisions. Okay. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so jets. Um, so what is a jet? Where, why do we even need to talk about jets in the first place? I tried to find a good animation about this, but I couldn't, so I have my own little version. So let me just kind of animate a proton collision for you, the extent that I can. So here's two protons. This is my PowerPoint version of an LHC collision. So if you, if you zoom in on the protons, you see this. Uh, I don't have a paper for it. Right, so, so really, you think of a proton as this soup full of quarks and gluons and you know, each of these, these sort of hard things inside a very soft body um, of a proton, and roughly the size of the proton, as we said, is around a femtometer, roughly lambda QCD. Um, so you have two of these, and they collide, and most of the time, the kind of soup just swashes through the other, the other thick of soup, but sometimes you get this hard little vegetable in the middle of the soup, uh, begging it to the other vegetable, and you get a collision. And if it's a very high energy collision, that happens at a short distance scale. So we're interested in, say, you know, 100 GeV. Uh, so 100 GeV inverse is some scale that's, you know, a percent of a femtometer, um, which is much smaller. And then 
As you know, the QCD, the strong interaction, is very weak at those length scales. So well within the proton, it's essentially a free theory. Uh, so what happens is you produce, you bang them together, and you produce uh, charge, QCD charged particles that move out, and then they radiate. And it's basically Bremsstrahlung, just like you would have in electromagnetism, where you have an electron that radiates photons. Within the proton, you can think, think of QCD as perturbative. So you have some just kind of moves along and radiates. And you have this sort of semi-classical radiation process, as you would have in a, any kind of uh, a charged particle moving along. Um, and so that, that radiation happens within the proton. So these lines represent quarks and gluons that radiate. And then it gets to this femtometer scale. And the femtometer scale, the QCD becomes strong. And when it becomes strong, you can no longer have free uh, colored objects. And so they hadronize. So they hadronize into things like kaons and neutrons and protons and pions. Now, and once they're hadronized, then they no longer strongly interact with each other, and they just kind of move away. So what you actually see in the detector is this collimated beam of kaons, neutrons, pions, and protons moving away, which is called a jet. And of course, since we took out something colored from the proton, the remaining part of the proton is also has some net color, and that has to be neutralized when the protons separate from each other by a femtometer. Uh, and that, that involves some radiation too, and those kind of move apart, and those are called the beam remnants. Uh, and those become the thing that goes down the beam, and there's a lot of protons and pions and kaons that go this way and that way. Those ways. So this is like a typical diejet event, and that's the the semi-classical picture of how they form. Uh, but the idea is that the jet, if you study a property of the jet, what you're really seeing is that short distance interaction that produced the hard uh, quark or gluon at short distances in the first place. So that's what you'd like to do, right? You see, you have the protons colliding, and you have some quark colliding within the proton, and you have this leading order hard process. Um, and then the semi-classical radiation process. And the idea is what you'd like to do is calculate this in perturbation theory, calculate some hard scattering amplitude. This doesn't have to be QCD. It could be you know, the supersymmetric production of gluinos that then decay to gluons, and you see a, a, a gluon coming out here. And what you'd like to do is, for example, reconstruct that gluon momentum. And there should be some coordination between the sum of the momenta of all these particles going out and the gluon momenta in the, the short distance hard process that was produced. right? Uh, and you'd like to, to do that, uh, you, you, you'd like to somehow associate some set of particles here that came from this quark at short distances. And uh, there's not a unique way to do that, because you could say, let me take the hardest particle and call that the, the quark. Um, let me take you know, the sum of them. Let me draw a cone around them. There's a lot of different ways that you can define a set of particles that you think should map to this short distance thing. Right? And of course, there isn't a unique answer. There isn't a unique way to map this combination of color neutral objects to a color charged object at short distances. So what you do instead is you come up with an algorithm for doing that, and then you look at the distribution of that algorithm. That algorithm's prediction for features. For example, I could look at the invariant mass of whatever I construct out of these particles over here, and whatever I construct out of this, that is the dijet invariant mass. And if there was a resonance here, I might see a peak in that. Right? It wouldn't exactly correspond to the partonic uh, energy of this intermediate particle, but it's some approximation that should also have a peak. And then you could do the mapping. If you have a good simulation of this process, you can then un un um, unwrap the simulation and figure out what the, the correlation is, what the mapping is from this short distance particle to the thing that you have. Uh, so again, jets are some, they're broadly speaking, some, some collection of particles going in the same direction in the detector. There's not a unique definition. And what you'd like to do is come up with a definition that suits your purposes best. And different purposes mean that their different algorithms are, are relevant. Um, so uh, the simplest way to define a jet is with a cone. We call a cone algorithm. Um, so one thing you want is when you're studying jet properties, you'd like things to be boost invariant. So you don't really care about the longitudinal boost. So you construct things using either transverse momentum or uh, rapidity differences or uh, azimuth angle differences. So the um, heat property, we talk about the, the distance between two particles, um, you know, it's kind of delta r, which is defined as the difference in the rapidities, or the pseudo rapidities. plus the difference between the azimuth angles. Right? So this thing is the difference in pseudo rapidities. So it's not exactly boost invariant, but it's approximately boost invariant. And to the extent that the particles are massless, um, pseudo rapidity reduces to rapidity. 
um, and its invariant. So this is this is some angular size. This delta r is in radians, so it's a size on uh, on the surface of a, of a circle, but it's really a, an angle on the sphere. So you should think of this like we have a sphere here, and there's some patch of radius r um, in angular size. So typical r's might be 0 0.4, 0 0.7 radians um, for the radius of this. So one thing you might do is say, let me find a jet. Let me take, oh, I don't know, the hardest particle in the whole event, the most energetic particle, and draw a cone around it of some size, say a cone around it of you know, half a radian, um, and call that the jet. And you can do that, and that's called a cone algorithm. Uh, unfortunately, the cone algorithm isn't infrared safe. So infrared safe is a property we'd like our algorithms to have. And what it means is the simplest way to think about infrared safety is that if I tried to calculate something in perturbation theory using that algorithm, I would get a finite answer. Right? The infrared divergences would cancel between the virtual graphs and the real emission graphs. And that's not obvious when that would happen. Um, but a, a good rule of thumb for when something is infrared safe is if I take a particle and I replace it by two particles with half the energy going in exactly the same direction, uh, I should get the same value, I should get the same particles going into the jet. right? Because the amplitude for this to happen is essentially infinite in QCD. You can't distinguish between this kind of collinear separation of a particle. You'll, there's no way to distinguish one particle going here, say one gluon, from two gluons going in exactly the same energy, a direction whose sum is that, right? Because a gluon can split into two collinear gluons and then say merge back into another gluon. And you can't tell this is going on if they're going in exactly the same direction. Uh, there's no way to experimentally distinguish one really hard gluon from two half hard gluons going in the same direction. They'll deposit the same amount of total energy in the calorimeter um, and so on. Uh, um, so this should be collinear safe. implies an exactly collinear splitting it gives the same value for the observable. The observable in this case being, say, properties of the jet, the jet momentum. Um, uh, so uh, another property you want is for it to be soft safe. So that's saying that if we take this and go to this plus an, uh, a zero energy gluon. Uh, so this is, um, or it's sometimes called infrared safe. People use infrared to mean the soft radiation and collinear to be in collinear splittings, but also we talk about infrared divergences as being either soft or collinear. Um, so this is, you know, adding a zero energy particle. And it doesn't have to be exactly zero. It could be arbitrarily small. Um, does not change the observable. Uh, so for example, this cone algorithm, if we start the cone around the hardest particle, well, is that uh, collinear, is that infrared safe? Yes, you got it. Did you? Why not? Um, r right. I mean, what 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 I think you're trying to say is, if you take a particle, if you, if, if the algorithm is say take the hardest particle in the jet and draw the cone around that, if I take that particle and replace it by a particle with ha two particles with half the energy, then the hardest particle might be somewhere else in the event completely. Right, so that kind of thing that's a small change from the point of view of the detector makes a big change in the point of view of the observable. Right? So this kind of seeded cone doesn't really work. Um, there's, there's other ways to have cone algorithms where you do some iterative process and, and you say, well, take the hardest draw cone and then uh, try moving it around to center around the cone that you formed. Take the total energy in the cone and then move it around and do this iterative process. Um, in any case, nobody uses these algorithms anymore. Uh, Yeah. That, right, that's right. So from the experimental point of view, it looks exactly the same. I mean, you, you can't distinguish it. Well, it, it depends what you're, you're, you're talking about. So this is kind of an in-principle feature of the algorithm. Nothing prevents you from running these algorithms on the data no matter what. And you'll get some distribution, and you can make sense out of this. 
But one feature we'd like is that we measure this on hadrons, and we do the calculation with partons. If we do the calculation with partons, we should get a similar answer to with hadrons, up to correction suppressed by, say, lambda QCD over the energy of the jet. Right? And for that to be true, we can't actually calculate this at the parton level, because if we have the splitting, which has an infinite cross-section, um, basically what happens is the virtual contribution to this, you know, a loop like this, um, would, would be the same order in perturbation theory as the square of a kind of a splitting. And so if you don't go in the same jet, then they don't cancel. The infrared divergence associated with them don't cancel. So you'll just get infinity if you try to use this algorithm in perturbative QCD, and therefore you can't possibly agree with the data. So an uh, infrared safe algorithm has a better chance of the theoretical calculation agreeing with the data. Um, what about soft so soft safety, so this, uh, the cone algorithm is soft safe, but other ones aren't. Um, uh, okay, so uh, modern algorithms are uh, what are called iterative algorithms. So, iterative uh, jet algorithms. So, so what we do is we take. Um, let's write this. So one we. Uh, Calculate the pairwise distance dij uh, between all objects in the event. We uh, merge. the two closest objects, that is the smallest dij, and then we repeat until no two objects are closer than, I don't know, some d. Um, which you can think of as the jet size. So I made this description very general. I didn't tell you what the objects are or what dij is. Um, so what are objects? Objects can be uh, particles, you know, pions, protons, and so on, the real things that are produced. For example, if you run a simulation like Pythia, it'll tell you where all the pions are, um, and then you can run your algorithm on that. Um, it can be partons, meaning quarks or gluons. So if you do, if you apply this calculation to your theoretical calculation in perturbative QCD, uh, for example, MCFM is a perturbative calculator, uh, or MADGRAPH or something like that, you might want to act on the partons, uh, but you could apply it to that. Um, you could apply it experimentally, maybe we don't distinguish all the particles, you could apply it to the energy deposits. Energy deposits, sometimes you can't distinguish what the particles are, or topo clusters. Topo clusters are uh, what Atlas uses to aggregate the energy and it's slightly more information than just exactly where the energy goes, but it's roughly what you think of as kind of the pseudo objects that Atlas reconstructs. CMS is something a little bit more sophisticated called uh, particle flow, which tries to reconstruct exactly where each particle is. Um, but you can use any of these objects and the idea is if it's a good jatter algorithm, you should get the same answer no matter what objects you use, as long as they're kind of reasonable. Um, so there's different choices for DIJ. What? It some well, it depends on what dij is. So, so you want to stop on dij. So the units of this have to match the units of that. So I'll give you some examples. Oh, yeah. You don't pre-choose your cone size. Well, you do, but some of them aren't cones, oh, okay. right? So it's not when you call it a cone size. It depends on whether it's a cone algorithm. Oh, okay. um, so there's some there's some stopping size which characterizes what it is, right? Um, I mean, you may not, for example, you might want to just find all jets harder than 25 GeV, and they might come out of different sizes, right? So you might not want to describe the angular size, but the energy of the jet to determine when the algorithm stops. Uh, but, uh, but most modern algorithms use a cone size. So um, there's basically three algorithms that people use. And one of these people use a lot more than the others. So the first is called the cambridge aachen algorithm. We take dij to be rij. Um, let me normalize it to r. So it's the, uh, the pairwise distance between the particles normalized to some parameter, the cone size. 
right? And then we stop when d equals 1, which is when there's no two particles closer than, than the distance r. Um, there's also, so uh, because r is defined in terms of uh, rapidity and azimuthal angle, uh, if, uh, so there are a lot of particles, for example, going very close to the beam. Right? So what would be the distance between a particle very close to the beam and a particle produced centrally? Y infinite? Yeah, that's right. So, so K Talk has this nice feature that nothing ever gets close to the, with the beam, and the beam kind of goes off on its own. And so you stop when there's a size r. So the, the things that are closer to the beam are naturally bigger because the relative rapidities are bigger. Um, so uh, you don't need to worry about a separate beam distance measure. For other algorithms, you do. Um, so another one is the KT algorithm, where dij um, is given by the minimum of uh, KTI, let me write PT, PTI, PTJ times RIJ. So this is the, the angular distance multiplied by the minimum uh, uh, the minimum. This is R I J squared over R squared. Um, and for the K, for the KT algorithm, you also need to specify distance to the beam. So the distance to the beam is given by the uh, P T of I. So the distance between particle I and the beam is given by P T. Right, and this is a dimension full scale, so here you set D is some PT scale. Right, so this tells you you form a certain jet up to a certain energy. Right, so I it would ask for 25 GeV jets and it would cluster until there's no jets that have more than 25 GeV. So with this PT RI, it's really the energy times the distance, um, which is some include, so this weights the higher, the, I don't want to say. Um, Oh, sorry, this is squared. Um, yeah. so, so what this does is the minimum PT is the softer particle. So what this is doing is it's taking particles that are soft, that is a small transverse momentum, and clustering them first. So they have small distances, so they get clustered before the ones that are farther away. Right. Well, Rij just uses this angular sail independent of, of distance. So Kt is something that says, well, there should be a collinear singularity associated with small energy differences, and so we should include that in the clustering algorithm. Um, and uh, let me put it here. Let me read this. And the third algorithm that's commonly used, and this one is used more than anything else, is anti-Kt, where Dij is the minimum of 1 over pt i squared, 1 over pt j squared times r i j squared over r squared. Um, and the distance to the beam is given by 1 over pt squared. Uh, so anti-kt is a little weird, because while kt clustered the softer particles first, this clusters the harder particles first. Um, and uh, so let me. Let me show you a little bit about what these things look like. Um, oh, right, here's a digit event. Um, so here's a kind of little animation showing what happened. So we have, say this is, suppose we just have four particles in the event. Um, if we were using Kabajakin, we would compute this angular distance between them. So for every pair of particles, uh, we compute distances. So some of them, you know, this is just some cartoon of how this would work. So two of the, these, let me use my pointer. So these two are separated by 0.3, these are 1.2, and so on. So you would say, well, now let me take uh, the two closest ones. So that's the one separated by 0.3, and I merge them together. So now I get a new particle whose momentum is the sum of the momentum of the two particles I merge. Now I only have three particles. Um, and so as I'm interested in, in you know, r equals 1, then I would say, well, there are particles that are closer than r equals 1. There's those two that are 0.7, so let me merge them. So I merge them next, and now they're all separated by 1, so I can stop. So I would say I have two jets um, of r equals 1. So when you merge that, what would this what is that in r that Right, you just sum the momenta of the two particles, and you replace the particle in your iterative procedure by the, uh, the particle with the sum of the momenta. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so that's the basic idea. Here's kind of what they look like when you... Oh, yeah, that'd be helpful, thanks. Uh, so here's an uh, example of the differences in these algorithms. So I'm showing you uh, Cambridge Aachen, KT, anti-KT, and a cone algorithm. This is an iterative cone algorithm, which is infrared safe. Uh, um, what you can see is, uh, so one thing about KT is because it uses the soft, the softness is included, sometimes, oh, well, I should tell you what these plots are. First of all, these are Lego plots. So this is uh, rapidity, and this is azimuthal angle. So this is the beam is unfolded. It's really a cylinder rotated around this way, and we unfold it. So this is one beam line and one beam line. So this would be y equals minus infinity is the beam, but really we're just interested in the mostly central region. Although, remember, minus, minus 6 is you know 5 degrees, um, so it's very close to the beam. And what they do is we take an event, which these, these histogram towers are the energy deposits at particular angles, in rapidity and azimuthal angle. Uh, and what they've done is they've also added a bunch of soft radiation, you know, basically zero energy particles everywhere. And what that does is it tells you what area of the detector is included in the jet clustering. And this is useful to tell you what region the, the, the jet algorithms are sensitive to. So it's all the same event clustered with different algorithms. Um, and what you see is KT, uh, this jet here, might pick up regions from, I mean, this is almost back to back. This particle over here and this particle are separated by almost pi. So it's clustering particles on opposite sides of the detector. Um, uh, Cambridge Aachen also does that. You might think because this is, involves angular scale, everything would be round, but it's not really round. Um, and uh, it turns out the one that has the roundest jets is this anti-KT with this very unintuitive clustering the hard particles first. There's ways to understand why that happens, but I'm not um, I'm going to get into that here. Uh, I, but I, I do want to point out that having round jets is very important from an experimental point of view. Uh, and one of the main reasons is because they can control the systematics on their measurement. That the detector has a bunch of different parts, and the uncertainties on, on how you measure things in different parts of the detector are very different. The best resolution, energy resolution, is in the central part of the detector, and as you go forward, um, you run into to problems, well, it's just, you know, things are more boosted and you have less energy resolution. Um, the detector just isn't as good in the forward regions. So if you want to say a jet where I know the energy very well, you want it to be central. Um, but if you have something like this, which involves uh, particles from everywhere, you're gonna, the, the overall jet energy scale is going to suffer because of that coordination between uh, different parts of the detector. You basically have the, the weakest part of the detector determines the overall uh, energy uncertainty. Um, so this was a problem with a lot of these algorithms. And this came out only in 2008 um, uh, by Gavin Salam and collaborators proposed this algorithm, which is very local in the detector, and all the jets are kind of uniform size, and you end up with very good jet energy scale calibrations. So almost all jet physics is done using this anti-KT algorithm these days. Um, unfortunately, CMS and Atlas use slightly different jet sizes, so you can't directly compare observables, but that's improving. But roughly R equals 0.4 jets. Um, you can see here the radius is roughly 0.4 because this is units of, so this is 1, and so that's a half. Oh, I'm sorry, this is like R equals 1. Um, the radius of these circles is around 1, in, uh, 1 radian. Uh, OK. Um. Thank you for uh, QCD jets that have different cone sizes. For QCD jets, they have different cone sizes. Like I'm not sure what a QCD jet means. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're getting better, but, but previous studies, Atlas would use 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, and 1.1, and CMS would use uh, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. So you couldn't directly compare anything, but but uh, they're improving. So 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 um, one question you might ask about jets is how do you choose this parameter r, right? Do you want it to be big or small? What's the optimal? You know, if you're trying to do something like reconstruct the parton momenta, um, in principle you want to take it very large because that makes sure you get all the hadrons that came from the fragmentation and the showering of that parton. Uh, um, but on the other hand, if you take it very large, you end up pulling in radiation not from that particle. Right, if there might be you know underlying event that is collision secondary partons or pile up events. So the bigger you take it, the more sensitive you are to things you're not interested in. Um, but you also pick up more of the stuff you are interested in. So it's sort of a compromise. Um, here's a kind of uh, showing what happens to different R. So this is uh, we have dijet events. So this is PP to quark QQ bar, um, and we just look at the invariant mass of the jets from a resonance here of uh, 100 GeV. So in principle, what you'd like to do is take all the particles from this jet, all the particles from that jet, construct the jet four momenta, add them together and square it, get an invariant mass, and that should have a peak at mx, the mass of this particle, 100 GeV. 
So if we take r equals 0.3, you can see, well, the real resonance should be here, but we're getting something that's a little too small. Right? And we're getting it too small, and you can say, well, that's because r is too small, and so there's actually particles produced from the radiation of this jet that go outside the cone, and we're not picking them up. Right? So what you do is you increase r. Um, so here's the jet. So as we increase r, here's 0.4, you can see the jet mass uniformly gets bigger. Right? And of course it's going to get bigger because you're increasing the momentum of everything as you increase the cone size. Um, so eventually you start to get something close to um, the right scale, and then when you start taking it too big, you end up with too big of a mass because you're pulling in things, radiation from this beam that goes into the jet, and so on. So there's an optimum, and the optimum depends on what process you're interested in. Here you see it's around r equals 0.7. Um, at higher energy, it turns out smaller r's are a little better, and r equals 0.4 is pretty, is pretty standard um, for high energy stuff. Uh, but there's a trade-off, and you have to just keep in mind that there's a trade-off when you do various different um, relations. I was going to say, where is this going? Okay. Uh, are there questions about this? So, yeah. In this case, we, we knew though the answer. That's not how we can think of the optimal that R. Yeah. But uh, in their case, how do we know the optimal R? Do we have to assume some theoretical thing and then play like, with this thing? Well, it's like anything else. If you're looking for something, you optimize things for the thing you're looking for. So if you're doing a search, Say I'm looking for supersymmetry, I'm looking for a 2 TV resonance, I'll run simulations and figure out what R I want, and then use that R on the data. Right? Even if you're doing a completely data-driven analysis, you still can optimize R based on simulation. Right? It doesn't matter if the simulation is getting things exactly right to optimize R, but it might matter for actually finding the signal. Uh, what is what? F. Where's F? Oh, uh. F is a, oh, it's a parameter of the syscone algorithm, this, this, uh, Infrared safe cone algorithm. It, the, the, uh, yeah, that's Cass Compton. This is all from there's a web page that Gavin Salam made where you can see this for all these different algorithms. I'm going to see how it works. I just picked one. Um, so if you could have like the uh, anti KPD, could you see why that would be better or worse than the other ones based on these sort of plots? Or that uh, no, you really wouldn't see it from this sort of plots. The reason it's better is mostly experimental uh, reasons. Um, uh, there's not, in any sense, less sensitivity. I mean, it actually has other nice theoretical properties. It's free of what are called clustering logarithms when you calculate jet properties. Um, I, I, so jet, I could give four lectures or ten lectures all about jet physics. It's something that I work on actively, and it's really, really interesting. And just to give you an overview of why it's interesting, what, what, if you do this, and you're basically taking the jet and constructing the form of jet, taking the invariant mass, well, that's fine, and that's something they've been doing at, at Hadron Colliders for 30 years. Uh, but what they're doing at the LHC that they didn't do at previous machines is looking inside the jet. You say, well, I don't want to do just construct the form momenta. I want to see what the jet is made of. I want to look at properties of the jet. For example, can you determine the jet quantum numbers? Can you determine if the jet came from a quark or a gluon? Right? So gluon jets are somewhat wider than quark jets because they're color, they have more color charge. They have a factor of CA instead of CF, which is about twice as many, twice as, twice large charge. Just like a particle of charge two would radiate more electromagnetic, radiate more photons. A QCD charged gluon would radiate more gluons. Um, so you get wider things, you get heavier things. Uh, but of course, if, you just, if you're not looking at the width of the jet, just the overall momentum, then you don't see that. So if you just reconstruct the jet as a form momentum, you're throwing out the information that would be useful for telling if it's a quark or a gluon. Why do you care if it's a quark or a gluon? Well, for example, supersymmetry, um, if you produce, pair produce galenos that decay to squarks, that decay to quarks and neutralinos, you know, typical, these signatures that have eight jets and missing energy, those eight jets are almost always quark jets because they come from cascade decays of squarks. Um, and so if your backgrounds for eight jets are almost all gluon jets, because QCD is this gluon factory, right? The protons made up of gluons, you produce gluons, gluons radiate gluons, so you get eight gluon jets as your background and eight quark jets from your signal. So even if you can distinguish quark from gluon, gluon jets very weakly, um, if you, have, you multiply it to the power of eight because you have eight jets, it would be very useful. So one thing people have been looking at is how do you tell apart a quark jet from a gluon jet? You can look at the width, you can look at the mass, you can look at the, the subjettiness, you can look at various angular moments. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, other things people look at, so you might look at the charge of the jet. Can you tell an up quark jet from a down quark jet? So one way to distinguish up quark from down quark might be the electric charge, um, that they have you know, fairly different electric charge, and that somehow translates into the, the sets of the charge of the pions that are in the jet. Um, and of course, on any individual jet, you'll never be able to map that, because of course you don't get a net charge of two thirds. But on average, you can actually see distinctions. And if you had an ensemble of jets, you know, suppose we have a very clean signal of 
uh, you know, two jets and missing energy. And we want to know if those two jets come from the decay of an up squark or a down squark. Right? Clearly, that's very important from a model building point of view. And there's been techniques that have been developed over the last five years or so to be able to do that. Um, of course, you need pretty clean samples, uh, but it's been validated on data from, for example, top decays. And this seems like a, a workable option. Um, another, another huge area of rapid development is boosted objects, where you have a very energetic, like a W boson. If it has a tremendous amount of energy, when it decays, it'll decay to, say, a, a up and a down bar quark, which turn into jets. So the W's at rest, they go back to back, but the more you boost the object, the more energy the W has, the more those jets go off in the same direction. And then instead of seeing two jets, you see one jet. Right? So how do you know that that one jet came from a W instead of just being some QCD jet? So what you can do is look inside the jet and look for these two subjets within the jet. Uh, but you can't do that by just finding jets running the jet algorithm at a smaller size because they kind of overlap on each other. So you have to use more, more interesting, more sophisticated methods. Uh, so jet substructure, really the, the, the point I want to emphasize is this is something that we're doing at the LHC now that we didn't do at the Tevatron because the LHC has much better angular resolution. It can resolve things down to, I don't know, less than you know, a, a half a radian or 0.1 radians. They can really see individual particles. A lot of this comes from the tracker. Also, the electromagnetic calorimeter has a resolution of around a third of a radian. So you can get pretty good angular resolution. I mean, CMS has this particle flow where they tell you the form momenta of every particle. So LHG is a better machine. It has better angular resolution and energy resolution, so you can really see this substructure. Um, also, this higher energy means these boosted objects become more relevant. Right? When you produce a 2TVW, you really need to be able to figure out that it was a W, and the Tevatron just didn't produce 2TVWs. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why the current development, also the, the, the software has improved. Right Now we have calculational properties. You can use neural networks. You know, there's a lot of work on you know, deep learning and so on to distinguish these objects. So there's been a lot of advances, theoretical and experimental, that have promoted this as an active field uh, of research. There's a question? You're more than just the vertex, right? So even for neutral particles, you can you can start to resolve their energy. So they had, so the vertex tells you certain things, and then the electromagnetic calorimeter tells you other things, and and then the, the hadronic calorimeter tells you other, and the muon tracker tells you other things. And you'd like to use all of that information together to reconstruct the form momenta of every pion and neutron and proton in the event. And the better the the segmentation, the granularity is of the different parts of the calorimeter, the better you can do this. So that's the that's the goal. Um, um, you can do that, but you can also have a very uh, a, a jet, a QCD jet that has happens to have 80 GeV of mass, right? In fact, that's not uncommon because um, QCD, you know, there's there's a factor of 10,000 times more QCD jets than there are W jets, so you're going to be completely overwhelmed by that long tail that happens to be in the invariant mass region. You have to do something more sophisticated. Um, yeah, people, well, the dibos and excess seem to be just, uh, well, yeah, I mean, they, they are used for dibos on searches. I mean, that, that excess that went away, um, they, that was involved in, in boosted analysis. Um, in fact, that excess, so that was a 2TEV excess. And if you look at a, a, a so the, the, what he's referring to was there was a, a, an anomaly seen at the LHC in the previous run of a 2TEV, something that seemed to decay to W bosons, um, that uh, may have been back to back with energy of around, uh, you know, a TEV each, and there was uh, some small resonance there. Uh, but if you look at a jet, a QCD jet that has a TEV, and you ask what is the typical mass of that jet, right? Turns out, rough rule of thumb is it's roughly down by a factor of alpha, so that's around a tenth. So the typical mass is around 100 GeV. Um, actually, it's a little less, and it turns out the typical mass of a two TEV jet is around 80 GeV. So if you just look at the, if I look at the invariant mass, the distribution of the digent mass is a, the, the cross section is a function of digent mass. I'll actually in QCD see a bump at 2 TeV, and that was part of the reason that they see an excess, is because just naturally QCD has a bump there because the jet mass is in the are in the W mass. Yeah. So you could sculpt your backgrounds, and so if you have to know QCD, you have to know how QCD works to be able to predict those things. Um, you know, oh, I, I should also mention there's a lot of theoretical progress in calculating jet properties. Uh, this mostly was talking about experimental, but we can actually use precision physics to go beyond the level of these simulations. You know, resum logarithms at next to next to leading logarithmic accuracy, compute next to next to leading order distributions. And there's been a lot of advance in understanding these things uh, from first principles in QCD. Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding neural networks, yeah. Uh, 
they're being used to look for search for generic things like uh, look for new physics that not you know just in the data. Uh, not not really. Um, it's very hard to look for something generic. I mean, a lot of these neural networks you have to train on things that you know. So you train it very well to distinguish things in certain categories. I mean, but if you don't know what the category, you can't train for things that you don't look for things that are not that are not. Well, you could try. I don't know how to do that. Uh, that that's very hard to train to look for something else. You need a very smart network. Maybe in 10 years or 100 years, the computers will be smart enough to find things that we don't know what they are. Right now, they only work at finding things that we know what they are. Um, but we just don't know how to tell them apart. How do they, how they, well, right, so, so you, if you have a boosted W, or say a quark jet and a gluon jet, right? So roughly you can say, well, the mass is different, maybe it's wider, but if you just look at the overall distribution of radiation, you could think of that like an image. You could just think of, you know, again, think of these Lego plots, um, right? So you look at the distribution of where all the radiation goes. Say I had one of these was a quark jet, and one of these was a gluon jet, right? And I just simulate, uh, you know, 100,000 of these, and I think of it as, as a picture. So it's a circle. And each pixel in the image has a brightness given by the energy deposits, right? And then I can use the same kind of algorithms I use to do facial recognition. I just send it 100 uh, men faces, and the men are all quarks, and 100 female faces. And then I ask, you know, I ask it to tell apart. I ask it for a generic jet, whether it's a man or a woman. And that's exactly the same thing that facial recognition does, you know. And, and I can do more sophisticated things. Maybe I could ask it up and down, which is, you know. A, different kinds of women, and you can, you can have more sophisticated uh, algorithms. But basically, you're using that same type of technology. Yeah, and my question is, how yeah. does it compare to the stuff, like the standard stuff, like the anti-KT algorithm, or, or I don't know? Well, it's not the anti-KT algorithm. It doesn't do anything for you. You start with the anti-KT algorithm to find the jet, and then you have all these things within the jet, and then you post-process that using these networks. Um. OK. Wow. Right. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, okay. Other other questions about jets? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, naively, when I when I have a soft radiation coming out, yeah. I would think it, it would be close to the soft. And so, so I think that is smart. Uh. If, if PT is small, then this is large. Right. So it's not the minimum one. Right. right, so it doesn't get clustered. It does, but it's true. Well, I mean, eventually, not very soft stuff. Um, I, I, yeah, it's, it's not intuitive why this works the way it does, but you can sort of work it out. There's some examples, but it'll, it'll take a little while. We can talk afterwards. Um, OK, I'm going to go over here. Well, so towards the standard model. So what I'm going to talk about next is just various things that we see in the detector and how do we know what they are. Um, I like drawing this uh, you know, cartoon of the particles in the standard model. Where we draw it as a circle. Um, and divide it this way. Maybe there's a hole in the middle for the Higgs boson. So you've probably all seen this graphic. I should have just taken a slide of it. Um, but we basically write the up sharp and top this way. Couple to the photon. What did you say? The Pokemon. <laughs> I guess so. And w and Z. Um, and uh, tau. These are the leptons. These are the neutrinos. Uh, and this is just one of many ways to represent the standard model. Uh, but I like it because the cor the Higgs is kind of the centerpiece of this of our current understanding of the standard model. Um, uh, these are the uh, leptons down here, the quarks up here, um, the uptight quarks over here, the downtight quarks over there. Uh, anyway, these are the vector bosons and the Higgs. Uh, whatever, I'm just writing on the particles. Okay, so what do we know about these particles? Uh, well, we know their mass and their charge. So let's just go over that. What is the mass and the charge of the neutrinos? What's the electric charge? What's the mass? Roughly zero. Okay. Uh, bottom, 4, 4 GeV, OK. Strange, what, what, what? 95, let's say 100 MeV. Uh, down, OK, 5 MeV, doesn't really matter. Let me say 0. Uh, <laughs> top, uh, I shouldn't have drawn this here, 170. 
GEV, maybe 173, depending on how you count. A charm, what? One GEV, okay. Up, zero. Tau, 1.7 G, EV. Muon, you guys can see this, but you should know this. 100 MeV, an electron, half an MeV. Uh, w, photon, gluon, Z, 91. Okay. Okay, so that's where we get started. And, and the Higgs, I forgot the Higgs. 125. Okay. Um, okay. So let's start. Uh, let's start with the W. What is the W boson decay to? That's mass. 80 GeV. Um, what is the W boson decay to? Quarks and leptons. Okay. So which quarks and which leptons? Right, so it can decay to say up, down bar. It can decay to up. What else can it decay to besides up, down bar? S bar. Up. Charm bar? No, B bar. Right. So it's one of the up types and the anti down type. Right, and then you just do it by charge conservation, right? So this would be W plus or W minus? W plus, because the up is a positive charge of two-thirds, right? So up and then down bar has a positive charge of one-third, um, right? So these are all W plus decays. Uh, what else can decay do? Well, let's put in some more quarks. So there's the charm down bar. There's charm S bar. There's C B bar. There's T D bar. So you get a TD bar. Why not? The top is too heavy, right? So this one doesn't happen. Um, in fact, well, none of these happen. Okay. So what's the what are the relative sizes of these different decays? What determines it? The CKM matrix, right? So here, this vertex is given by VUD. What's VUD? Almost one. Okay, let's say it's one. Um, VUS. What? Yeah, well, it's not quite zero. Let's say 0 0.2. Um, uh, you know, it's the Kabibo angle, which is important for, uh, you know, it's not exactly zero. This one's pretty close to zero, but this is VUB, which is 0 0.004. So that's almost zero. Uh, this one down here, VCD, is 0 0.2. VCS is around one, so the diagonal elements are pretty much one, and then VCB is also around 0 0.04. So these are pretty small. These are order one, and these are not zero, but pretty small too. Um, so what do you get out of all this? Oh, and what else can the W decay do? Leptons. Right, so it can decay to electron and neutrino, it can decay to a muon and neutrino, it can decay to a tau and a neutrino. Uh, okay, so what is the uh, branching ratio of the W to, say, an electron? What is the relative size that it, it decays to these different processes? Well, how do you figure it out? Three colors, okay. So three colors, so the quarks have color, right? So, okay, let's ignore the, the off-diagonal CKM element, right? So if we ignore the off-diagonal CK elements, we can have W goes to U, D, bar. It can go to uh, C, S, bar. And it can go to E, nu, mu, nu, or tau, nu. Right? Um, but now these are colored and these aren't. Right? So these are, uh, these have, are colored triplets. So we get three more times these than those. Right? So we get uh, six, uh, of a total of six, nine, we get one ninth here, one ninth here, one ninth here, and 
six ninth here, right? Uh, so we can draw. Let's draw this as a pie chart. Uh, so the W decays to an electron around 10% of the time, and to a muon around 10% of the time, to a tau on around 10% of the time, and the rest of it, it decays to jets. That is, ups and downs, but really you can't tell them apart, deleting order. So that's how we see a W boson. Um, and in fact, the tau on, well, we'll talk about tau's a little bit more, but they don't, they don't show up just as leptons. Uh, so the W has about a 20% branching ratio in leptonic channels. Um, right, so 20% branching ratio to leptons. Okay. Uh, what about the Z boson? Let's do the same kind of analysis for the Z boson. So what can the Z decay do? What's that? QQ bar. So what can Q be? U, U bar, D, D bar, S, S bar, C, C bar, B, B bar, T, T bar. No, not T, T bar. Okay. Too good. Okay, what else can it decay do? What? L bar, right. So electrons, E plus, E minus, U plus, B minus, tau plus, tau minus, neutrinos. So nu, 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 there's three of those. Um, okay, so what's the branching ratio to, uh, um, I don't know, to electrons? 3%? Where do you get 3%? You remember. How do you remember? What if you didn't remember? Okay, well, let's do the same analysis. So again, these have color. So there's 5 of these times 3 is 15. And then there's 6 of these plus 6 is 21. So we get around 1 21st of the amount to the leptons and 15 21st to, to jets. Right? Um, so... What's 1 over 21? 5%. Um, turns out they're slightly different because remember the charge of the Z is, uh, you know, tau 3 plus Q sine theta, um, uh, or maybe minus, I don't know, plus or minus, depending on how you do it. And so uh, th this is the, the isospin, um, which is a half or minus a half. So it's a half for the leptons and minus a half for this. So um, it turns out you get, you get somewhat of a cancellation for the charged leptons, and you don't get that cancellation because Q is zero for the neutrinos. So it's actually slightly larger. You get more like, uh, instead of 5%, which is the average, you get 3% to the charged leptons and 6% to the neutrinos. Right? So the Z decays only 3% of the time to electron uh, E plus E minus and 3% to mu plus mu minus decays 18% of the time to neutrinos and uh, the rest of the time to jets. Right? So this is actually a big difference. And it's worth keeping in mind that if you want to find these things leptonically, um, and remember leptons are much easier to see than jets because you can tell it was a muon and QCD doesn't produce muons, uh, but it does produce a lot of jets. So it's very hard to find a Z decaying to jets, but it's very easy to find a Z decaying to electrons or muons. Unfortunately, you only get muons a third of three percent of the time. Well, with the W, you get a ten percent of the time, right? But if you have, say, ZZ, if you want two Zs, then you get that three percent squared, and you're killing all your cross section, right? While with Ws, you do a little better um, because squaring ten percent and squaring three percent ends up being very different. Um, so these are just good numbers to keep in mind, right? So the important point is the branching ratio of Z to mu plus mu minus is three percent, while the branching ratio or of, of W to, e, to electron neutrino is uh, 10%. Uh, OK? So that's, that's what we got for the heavy gauge bosons. Next, let's talk about the top quark. The top quark is a really interesting quark. It's got a lot of fun physics associated with it. Uh, and it's uh, different from the other quarks in that it tends to decay before it hadronizes. 
while the lighter quarks tend to hadronize before they decay. Um, so the top quark decays through the weak interactions to a B and a W, which then decays. Question? What about the taus? Oh, why did I not write taus? Well, yeah, well, taus are kind of funny things. They're not really jets. They're not really leptons. We'll, we'll talk about them. We're going to go through. I'm, I'm going through that circle from the inside out. Uh, we're starting at top, and we'll kind of go around that way, and we'll get to taus. And then I'll tell you what happens to them. Won't take long, although everything seems to take longer than I expect. But but basically, they decay to low multiplicity jets. Sometimes they decay to leptons. Um, they're they're funny things. Okay, so uh, the top always decays to a B and a W, um, essentially 100% of the time. Although you can look for exotic decays of the top, um, and the W decays um, according to that pie chart as we discussed before. Um, Right, so that means that uh, T goes to BW goes to E or mu 20% of the time. Uh, and so what, mostly what we're interested with tops is you produce them dominantly f through gluons. So the production process is essentially gluons uh, go to TT bar pairs. Uh, this is mostly how we, how we uh, produce tops. And this cross section is actually quite large. You know, it's, uh, I don't know, nanobarns or, uh, you know, maybe uh, 500 picobarns, something like that. So we're producing a lot of tops. The LHC really is a top factory. Uh, um, and we can study properties of the top. We can try to measure its mass. For example, the mass of the top is something with a fair amount of uncertainty. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but first, how do you see this? Well, the tops can decay different ways. So they can decay to. Um, to basically B E nu or B mu nu. So that's a, a B jet plus an electron and missing energy, or a B jet and a muon for missing energy, or they decay to uh, three jets, right, which is a B plus two light jets 80% uh, of the time. Uh, well, 70%. They decay to taus also, but let me call this 70. Uh, then when you have two tops, so let me write the TT bar branch ratios. So TT bar, um, because of this 20%, if you want it to be fully leptonic, so TT bar can go to uh, both Ws to can decay to electrons or muons. But then you have to square this. You only get 4%. So 4% of the time is what we call fully leptonic. Um, 40% of the time. This is semi-leptonic. And uh, the rest, well, 55% of the time, hadronic. So this means hadronic means that both tops decay to three jets. Of course, there's two B jets and then two light jets. Semi-leptonic means one top decays to light jets, and one top decays to uh, a W decays leptonically. Um, and I should say, uh, the, so these channels are, are, are different. So when it's fully leptonic, uh, how do I want to say this? So leptonic is TT bar goes to WWBB, which goes to say electron, muon, neutrino, neutrino, BB. Right? So what you get here are two charged leptons. Um, but two neutrinos. And when you have two neutrinos, you can't reconstruct the transverse momentum of each individual neutrino. So this channel, this, it shows up as two jets, an electron, and a, a muon, um, which you can see. But first of all, only 4% of the time do you get this. And second of all, you can't fully reconstruct the event because you can't get the transverse momentum. So this channel isn't very useful. Um, I mean, it's been seen and used for stuff. But for example, if you want to measure the top mass, you're not going to get a good answer from this because of the uncertainty on the neutrinos and because of the small branching ratio. Uh, Semi-leptonic, you get uh, uh, two jets, two B jets, and two leptons. Uh, 
sorry, well, say a muon and a neutrino. So you get uh, a very nice, so basically what they do for, with, with semi-leptonic is uh, this decays to a W which goes to say a muon and a neutrino and a B jet, and this one goes to three jets. Right? So you actually get a very nice trigger, you get a very nice tag on this, because you get a hard muon and missing energy. So you can tell there was a W in the event. You can have two B jets, so you can tag the B jets. So you get a pretty clean signal over here, and then you have these three other jets, and you can use those to reconstruct the top mass. So this ends up being a very useful way to measure the top mass, because you have a clean tag for the event, so you can remove a lot of backgrounds. Um, while in contrast, for example, the fully hadronic event, where you have both tops decaying to three jets, you have huge backgrounds from QCD where you have six jets, right? And that's enormous. But here you don't have very much background from QCD. You might have, you know, W plus jet or, or other producers of Bs, um, but, but mostly there's not much background for this. So just understanding how things decay let you understand how you can see them. And, and, you know, it's not hard to work out these branching ratios. And there's important things like when you square it, you get down to 4% that I want you to keep in mind. Um, uh, there are more exotic possible decays of the top. So one thing people are looking for are flavor changing top decays, uh, which haven't been seen and there's bounds. So you know there's no flavor changing neutral currents in the standard model at, at tree level, but there's loop induced processes, but these are rather small. Uh, so um, I really want to talk about this. All right, you might imagine you could see a, a flavor changing top decay, say top to charm. Um, and if this happens, this might happen through a Z. Of course, it doesn't happen in the standard model, but you might imagine you could look for something like this a, a flavor changing top decay to a, a, a neutral pair. Right? And this would be pretty easy to see because you again use the tag and probe method where you have semi-leptonic tops. You have one side where you have a clean top tag um, from say a B jet and a lepton. Uh, and then the other side you look to see if there's any possibility of a, of a Z and a charm jet. Right? So people look for this and um, uh, I don't know. There's, there's, so in standard model this is, this is excitingly tiny. But in SUSY models you might have something with say, you know, um, yeah, you can have a Wino connecting between the top and the charm, and you can have something come out here, say a Z, and E plus E minus. So there's a lot of BSM scenarios where you would produce significant fractions of flavor changing top decays, and there's something that's pretty easy to look for at the LHC, and they're setting bounds better than previous experiments. Um, uh, right. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the top quark mass. Okay, so the top quark is very heavy, so it's important. So its mass, the current value of its mass is 170.34 plus or minus 0 0.27 statistical plus or minus 0 0.71 systematic plus or minus around 1 GeV from, let me say, theory. Um, and this is hard to quantify. So first of all, does anyone know what mass this is? When we talk about the top mass, there's a lot of different definitions of a top mass. This number 173, what does it refer to? Yeah. Simulation mass. Right. So, so um, when people write 173, they usually mean something called the pole mass. Um, so what you're referring to, this simulation mass, is often called the Monte Carlo mass. which is generally taken to equal the pole mass, which is not equal to the MS bar mass. Um, and the MS bar mass is the mass at the top. If you're doing some precision theory calculation, you want to know what the top mass is in MS bar. Uh, but you can, I don't have the number here, but uh, so you can convert between the top mass and the MS bar mass. This one equals around 165 GeV. And this conversion between the top of the MS bar and bar mass is known to three or four loops. Um, uh, so, uh, right. So 
So what is this? So what does the Monte Carlo mass mean? Well, what it means is when you measure the top mass, what you might do is say, look for these semi-leptonic top decays, take the mass of these three jets, look for a peak, and fit that to what you would get from your simulation, right? Where you have a mass parameter in your simulation to tell you what the top quark mass is. So that mass parameter appears in the top propagator, right? So, so the top propagator looks like 1 over you know, p squared minus m top squared um, you know, gamma m top. Right, you have a, a, a pole at the top mass and a width according to the top width. And so what, the, what Pythia would do is it just has this propagator and calculates some matrix elements or cross sections using this propagator. Right? And we talk about the, so you say it's close to the pole mass because this would be the location of the pole, or the real part of the singularity here is called the pole mass. But the pole mass is something that exists in, the pole mass is really the location of the singularity in the TT bar two point function. Right? I can calculate this two point function in principle in in quantum field theory, and it has a, a pole. It really doesn't have a pole um, because it's, it's uh, well, it doesn't have a pole for two reasons. One, because there's a width, so the pole isn't on the real axis, um, so the pole is slightly off, but also because there's a branch cut because it's charged. So you have to be a little careful about how you define the pole mass. Um, but in any case, there's a, there's, the pole mass is something you could systematically include radiative corrections to this two-point function, and it's only equal to the pole mass at leading order. The pole mass is only equal to this thing in the propagator in the program at leading order. So a lot of this uncertainty comes from understanding the mapping between this theoretically well-defined object, the top quark pole mass, and the parameter in the simulation that's used to, to calculate the distributions. Right? Unfortunately, we can't directly compute this and compare to data because you need to simulate it and you need to decay them, you need to reconstruct the jets and so on and run the detector simulator and all these things that are uh, important to get things right. So. There's a lot of different approaches to resolving this ambiguity between what this is. So this is what's called the Monte Carlo mass. Right, and this, the pole, pole of this is the pole mass. And this MS bar mass, you know, is called M top of, of mu equals M top is defined by the MS bar subtraction scheme. So it's a parameter in the Lagrangian of the theory um, using the convention that when you, when you calculate loops, you always drop the finite parts. And that gives you a well-defined definition of what this is. And then you can compute the corrections to this two-point function and map between the location of this singularity and MS bar. Um, and that's the thing that's done at, at loops. Um, there's actually some interesting physics associated with these different mass schemes. Uh, all of them, if you tried to do this conversion between MS bar and the pole mass, you would see that um, it actually doesn't converge very well. And in general, observables, when you calculate them in function of the pole mass, tend to have very poor convergence. Right? I mean, in general, in quantum field theory, almost everything we calculate is an asymptotic series, not a convergent series. So the coefficients start to shrink at the first couple of orders, and then they start to grow. Right? And how quickly that onset of asymptotic behavior sets in uh, determines how good of an observable something is. Um, and there's ways to make that precise, to, to, to quantify when, when that happens and when that doesn't. Uh, so to, well, well, uh, let me try to explain this. This is a kind of a subtle concept, but, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so all of these schemes have, uh, are asymptotic, and they all have, uh, well, so when you have an asymptotic series, so an asymptotic series, I don't know if I really want to get into this. Uh, um, in any case, you could show that the MS bar mass has better convergence properties, converges faster in perturbation theory than the pole mass. Uh, and you can see that actually in the conversion between the pole mass and the MS bar mass. Uh, um, in fact, recently people showed that this, the, the, well, that there's inherent ambiguity on the mass, uh, in the pole mass associated with this, this asymptotic behavior, which is around 100 MeV, um, which is actually less than you might expect. Naively, it could be 500 G, uh, MeV. Um, but people were able to show using rigorous theoretical calculations involving renormalons that actually the ambiguity is only around 100 MeV. Um, nevertheless, there is still this 1 GeV theoretical uncertainty associated with mapping between this Monte Carlo mass, which depends on a lot of things in the simulation. So for example, if you take the simulation and you don't change this mass, but you change the way hadronization works, you might change it by 500 GeV. Right? So there's, a, there's ambiguities on what this Monte Carlo mass means, and it's clear that there, we don't yet understand how to map that between uh, that and the, the, the pole mass. So that's kind of a, an active area of research in QCD to understand it. Uh, so what input do you use to get them with the MS bar mass? 
like it's not, not measured. Uh, well, it can be measured. So there's different ways to measure the, the uh, top quark mass. So if we, we talk about just looking at the invariant mass of the three jets and reconstructing the top mass, that you do the Pythia mass or the Monte Carlo mass. But other ways you do it, you might measure the total cross-section. Right? So the total cross-section is something that you can calculate in principle from theory without ever using the data. Right? So if I just know exactly how many top quarks I measure, and I know exactly the luminosity of the machine, so I can extract the full cross-section, um, then I can compare that to a theoretical calculation, which takes as input the MS bar mass for the top quark. Um, unfortunately, it also takes as input the Parkland distribution functions. So using this method, you get an uncertainty of around 2 GeV from the extraction of the quark mass. But in principle, it's something that if we improve the PDFs and if we understand our, our luminosity measurements uh, better, that means there's a you know, 10 to 20 percent uncertainty on the luminosity of the LHC. Uh, and and you know, we have to know that you found a top, and there's experimental uncertainties on whether we actually found them. Right? Uh, that is, that you're trying to find the total cross-section for the top. So it's not just enough to put hard cuts and know that you only have top events. You need to know how many events were top altogether. Um, a related method uses the differential cross-section. So you might calculate you know, d sigma, say, d m t t bar. Right? Something that's the, the t t bar invariant mass. Right? So you have a shape. You know, it might look like that or something. Right? And so there's a normalization of this, which is the total cross-section, which you could calculate. But you can also calculate this differential distribution as a function of, of the top quark mass. So even if you don't know the luminosity, this would normalize just one factor of overall normalization, but then you could fit um, uh, the shape to determine it. So there are methods that directly measure the MS bar mass, which is one way to reduce this theoretical uncertainty. Um, unfortunately, these methods have now larger experimental uncertainty, you know, for example, larger statistical uncertainty and systematic uncertainty than, um, than just fitting line shapes. Ah, great. So, so first of all, the the difference between the MS bar mass and the pole mass, you see it's 10 GeV. The 10 GeV is probably because alpha s is large, right? Um, but it's really not that big of a, of a correction, right? It's 10 GeV out of 173, so that's 5%, right? For the Z, it's less than 1%. So we do have to convert it, but the Z and the W aren't colored, right? And so they actually have much better localized poles, and so there's much smaller difference between the pole and MS bar. So, so we do compute them. It's also much cleaner to measure the invariant mass of the uh, the W and the Z. So the, the Z mass is mostly determined from LEP, uh, where they just actually went on the Z pole and they measured the line shape and they fit that to the energy of the beam. And that's a clean thing that you can do directly at MS bar um, from just knowing what you're measuring. Uh, the W mass is, uh, we talked about before, you fit it using MT and stuff like that, transverse mass. Um, and uh, you know it's better because it's leptonic, it's cleaner, and you just need to know how many events you have, and you don't have these same kind of problems. This is really something that's uh, really inherent to this funny the, the reason the top quark mass is funny is because it's colored, right? So it doesn't actually give a pole, you know, QCD is a confining force. So you can't ever have a free top quark. Well, you can, in principle, have a free W. I mean, it's, you know, we have charged stuff, right? So it's much, there's much less ambiguity. If it weren't for the electric force, you could have a perfectly, uh, you know, there, there, there's a isolated pole at the W mass up to QCD effect. While there's not an isolated pole in the top mass, it's a branch cut that's suppressed by lambda QCD, but that's large. So it's, it's kind of a mess, right? I mean, another way to say it is there's a, um, when you measure a top mass, you have to separate the fundamental top from the cloud of, of uh, electromagnetic radiation around it, right? But this electromagnetic radiation is really electrochromoelectric radiation. So there's this big Coulomb field of QCD force around it. And that has energy, right? There's like the Coulomb potential, 1 over R. And there's a tremendous amount of energy in the field. And what you'd like to do is separate out the energy from the cloud of QCD radiation around the top from the fundamental top, right? And of course, that's not well defined, but it, it, it's the thing that, so when you talk about the pole, you can't, it, th this pole mass includes all of that, as you know from the self-energy graphs from the electron and so on. Those are radiative corrections to the pole mass. Um, but the MS bar mass naturally subtracts this off. There's other versions that do it more directly, something called the potential subtracted mass and the 1S mass. Well, I should mention briefly the 1S mass. So, so one of the best ways to measure the top mass is going to be at any plus or minus machine. And where instead of looking at line shapes, you directly change the energy of the collision to be around 2 mt. And as you go above and below 2 mt, you can see there's actually a resonance. So if I measure uh, uh, basically s, or energy, ECM, and I measure d sigma, or just measure the total cross section for tops, um, what you'll see is at, at 2 mt, 
um, the cross section starts growing and then goes down. But you'll actually even see there's a, a slight, uh, there's something slightly below 2MT where there's a little bound state here. There's a TT bar bound state um, that in principle you should be able to see if you had any plus or minus machine. So knowing the location of this bound state lets you determine the top quark mass directly. So this is some, the, the idea is that if we had this machine, we can measure the top quark mass to 30 MeV or something. Um, and that's one of the motivations of not only building such a machine, but running it at uh, 350 GeV, um, which is part of the design goal. And in fact, that's something that uh, um, that the Japanese machine is planning to do, and the Chinese Z plus Z minus machine won't do. Um, so that the, it's an interesting goal because the uncertainty is so large that actually building a machine precisely to measure the top quark mass uh, is w would be something worth doing. And there's an interesting theory about about understanding this one s is the is the quantum numbers of the bound state of the TT bar. So just a one s state, and that's why it's called this one s mass, which is the something you calculate using non-relativistic QCD. Um, so this yeah. Isn't it the K four four minus bound state? Like, what is the story there? I mean, uh, well, so so um, it doesn't have to, right? So y you can actually see this in the resonance because it it it, it produces the basically non-relativistic tops that bind before they decay, and you see that effect here. So they can actually have annihilation decays where they bind together and decay back into gluons, eh? not to the weak decays. Um, but uh, um, I mean, what 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 we know is they don't hadronize before they decay, but that doesn't mean they don't bind together before they decay, right? Um, how do you get this? Well, you take it from this and you calculate it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not. It's just you know. Basically, alpha. It's minus alpha over pi um, times m top. Um, yeah. Are, are are they sensitive to the top mass? Yeah. yeah not nearly this well. Yeah. That's right. The MS bar mass is the thing you would use for electroweak precision measurements, but. Um, Yeah, it's well defined, but they're only logarithmically sensitive to the top mass, so you don't get. I mean, it depends on what you're observable. But S and T, for example, you're not going to get a precision measurement of the top mass compared to the direct measurements. Um. So, can you tell us more about the difficulty is that this is a tree level thing, and this is an exact thing. Right, the pole mass is the exact location of the singularity in the complex plane in this two-point function. So, uh, in the Monte Carlo, well, they're inherently leading order because they do this whole part on shower and everything, and you you can't just do one part at higher order and the rest. I mean, well, you can. You can calculate something at NLO, including NLO corrections. Um, but the real problem is that the thing that you extract has all these correlations with everything else in the simulation, right? So the, 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 the problem is the ambiguity in defining what this colored object is from the point of view of the simulation. You can't separate out when there's a top and it hadronizes due to the decay to B and then the B mixes with other stuff and how that mixing works to turn from the, the charged quarks into n color neutral objects. Um, that involves tuning and so on. And if you run different tunes of the simulation, you'll get a different value for this. And even if I completed a one loop propagator or a three loop propagator or whatever I had, um, you would still have this inherent ambiguity of order of GeV from uncertainties and how the simulations work. That there's, it's just a, um, there's so many things that go into it that are tuned that you can't separate it out from the purely theoretical calculation. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. I, maybe there's a better way to do it, and I think that there, this is an area where there could be some good ideas waiting to be found. Um, but, but what I know is that they're very sensitive. That there's there's inherent ambiguity in this Monte Carlo mass, and mapping it to the pole mass is not straightforward. Um, uh, yeah. To what extent can we trust the one GED uncertainty? Uh, yeah. So I don't know. It's, this is my estimate of it. You could trust it as much as you trust me. I can, <laughs> I can give you some papers, and you can form your own opinion. Um, it's not like any theoretical uncertainty. You know, it depends on the theorist. Uh, there's not, it's not Poisson fluctuations in which you can quantify it exactly. It's some estimate of what we think it is. Um, and, uh, I mean, honestly, I think it's actually smaller. I think that the truth is this way things work, Monte Carlo mass is probably pretty close to the pole mass. Um, 
you know, and you can one one hint you can get is that the central value for this is pretty similar to the central value you fit from cross sections and line shapes and so on. Um, but but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That that's right. If you want to, but when I talk about the total cross section, it's just count the number of, of tops you get at the collider, right? So you have to know every number, every top you get. You have to know where it is, right? So there's experimental uncertainty under that, right? That's one source of uncertainty. Um, another source of uncertainty is the luminosity. Even if you know how many tops you have, you don't know the cross section until you know the luminosity that the machine. You know how many protons you are colliding. That's actually not that easy to determine. And there's around a 10 to 20 percent uncertainty on the luminosity of the LHC. Right? So this is something you have to know what the luminosity is. Every time you collided, collided it, you have to know the luminosity. So if one time you didn't measure it well and they do these scans, you have to know how many protons you had, how fast they were, you know, how collimated the beam is, what the beam shape is. You know, or, or you can try to measure them directly from these forward detectors. But, but there's also uncertainty in the PDFs. Right? So to calculate the cross-section, now we know it a next-to-next to leading order. Right, so you do some two loop graphs and you figure out how to cancel the singularities and you write some code to do it. And then you have to convolve that with the Parton distribution functions. Right? So at next leading order, mostly it's this glue glue to TT bar, but you have other processes, QQ bar and so on, and there's loops. Um, so you have to know the glue on PDFs pretty well. Right? And those PDFs are usually only fit using leading order calculations, sometimes next to leading order calculations for the NLO PDFs, occasionally next to next to leading order. Um, but there's different PDF sets. And so they would give you a different cross-section, even with the same NNLO calculation, using different PDF sets gives you a different answer. There's still a fair amount of uncertainty into the gluon PDF. And when I say a fair amount, I don't mean that much. I mean, maybe 5%. But 5% uncertainty on the gluon PDFs, if you have a 5% uncertainty in the cross-section, and you get a 5% uncertainty on the top mass, that's a lot. right? I mean, we're talking you know, 1% or half a percent uh, is the goal here, um, or maybe even less. So if you have 5% uncertainty in the PDFs, that can dominate. So there's work in progress to improve those. And in principle, you want to do the PDF fits not involving tops at all. And there's an effort to do that precisely for the effort. So there's top-free PDF fits um, so that you can use it to determine the top mass. Um, but right now, knowing what the PDFs are, which you need to calculate the, the cross-section, um, is, is a leading source of uncertainty in that extraction. All right. Well, everyone's probably very hungry, so I'll, I'm happy to talk more um, later. But let's stop here. Wait, what? What did I say? Yeah. Yeah, you start out with something that's colored. Right. 